So I'm going to get started. Um, it's good to be back. I guess it's been like a year and a half. So I'm going to ask you the same thing I asked about a year and a half ago. I'm going to ask you to take a journey with me for the next one and a half hours through the literature. Only I'm going to ask you to do it in an evidence-based fashion. I'm going to present to you several concepts that you might think are strange, bizarre. Several of you are going to jump up on the table, start screaming, go running out the door. And all I can say is be patient. Because much of what I'm about to tell you is very scientific. Much of what I'm about to tell you is being done somewhere in the world every single day. The textbooks are about five to 10 years behind the current wave of thinking. You don't want your doctor practicing five to 10 years behind. So why should you want your paramedic practicing five to 10 years behind? So what I can control, I change. What I can't control, I fight against. And I'm gonna to talk to you I'm gonna actually start at the end this year, because I did something for Michael Vatch. I think this was from, um, was this WhatsApp? Are we on Telegram now? Um, and I created a pronouncement policy. I'm gonna implement this in my half of New Jersey in a week or two. And here's an article, where is it? Um, who should be transported to the hospital? I told you this last year that if you look at the people who don't get ROSC in a pre-hospital setting, 9%, 9% by the biggest study ever will walk out of the hospital alive. So the question now is, who are that 9%? How do we figure it out? This article tried to address it, and it did a fair job, because if it's one thing we don't do well, it's practice evidence-based medicine. When should we actually pronounce a patient in the pre-hospital setting? When should we transport them to the hospital? And when should we transport somebody who's still in ventricular fibrillation or even asystole? Because we know, the, we know for people in medical cardiac arrest, the best thing we can do is stay on the scene and run the cardiac arrest. For trauma, it's still load and go. So which patients should we stay on the scene and which patients should we transport? And we can see this, that we run codes for prolonged periods of time, and I'll call that 30 minutes, and then once we start moving the patient, compressions are not as good. The end tidal CO2 starts to go down, indicating poor left ventricular function, poor metabolism of the left ventricle substrates. And we decrease the patient's chance of walking out of the hospital alive by moving the patient. But there's got to be some point where we say we've been here long enough. <coughs> and the thing is, in cardiac arrest, we're still in the infancy. We treat all medical cardiac arrests the same way, the same algorithms. It's kind of crazy, isn't it? People code for so many different reasons, yet we shot them all the same, we treat them all very, very similar, and we're probably doing the totally wrong thing for patients in cardiac arrest. But let's talk about for a second just how to end it, how to pronounce patients. And here's what I did. I made this up. I made this up based upon several reviews of literature, but I'm gonna implement it. Maybe we can push this policy out because most of this stuff is grassroots, you and me, pushing to try and figure out when to transport a patient. Now, I think because we're doing better picture CPR for the first time ever, we're getting more patients with good end tidal CO2s, 30, 40, 50, and now we say it's hard to pronounce people. I told you last year, there's four papers in the literature that actually say if your end tidal CO2 is less than 10, after 20 minutes of resuscitation, you have 0% chance of walking out of the hospital alive. So you want objective data to feel good after the code when you go home that you pronounce somebody and they had no chance of surviving? End tidal CO2 less than 10, after 20 minutes of resuscitation, 0% of people in all four studies walked out of the hospital alive. So here is my protocol, a little made up, a little based upon the science. I did this for people over 18. I made up that number. Resuscitation at least 30 minutes from ALS initiation of care with no episodes of ROSC. If ROSC is obtained, the 30 minute time period will begin again if the patient loses pulses. Because ultimately when you create a policy, you want something people can remember in the heat of battle when they're coding patients. You don't want something that's 20 pages long because nobody will remember it. So some of this has to be simplistic. Number two is asystole for at least 20 minutes after initiation of resuscitation despite end tidal CO2 greater than 10, right? Because sometimes people are in asystole with end tidal CO2 is greater than 10, at least initially. And number three is persistent end tidal CO2 less than 10 after 20 minutes of ALS care. 
you disagree or there's a problem, you can call medical control. These are only for medical cardiac arrests, obviously not trauma arrests. And this to me is the best way to figure out when to pronounce patients, because again, we're getting people for the first time ever because of our good CPR, our PICRA CPR, our airway, not our poisons, but our airway and our good CPR, we're getting people in persistent VF for the first time ever with good end titles. And how long can you stay on scene? Can you stay on scene for 30 minutes, an hour, an hour and a half? Because you know, again, once you make the decision to transport a patient to cardiac arrest, you're basically saying, I don't believe you're going to survive because my CPR will not be effective once I start transporting the patient. I know everybody in this room is probably a big believer in Lucas devices and autopulses. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. I talked about that last year. But this is what I came up. So, Michael, are you happy? Well, we'll see if there's <laughs> So, um, I think it's somewhat evidence-based, but we need, again, simplicity, not complicated stuff. All right, I'm going to start here at the beginning, and then we'll go through stuff. All right, well, I talked about this last year. A lot of people stopped me at the door and said, you got your wish, we're getting rid of longboards. We are, throw your longboards away. People always say to me, I get about a request a week to come to somebody's ambulance service and talk about my longboard policy. I say, you don't need me to come, here's my policy. Never, never, never put anybody in a longboard, that's my policy. It's very simple. Several studies in literature show people actually do harm. This started in Sedgwick County in Kansas. Uh, by this woman who was brave enough to write on this legal document that we're harming patients by putting them on longboards. Certainly it's okay to use a longboard for extrication. Don't keep them on the longboard unless it delays transport to the hospital, but keeping them on longboards in general is associated with worse outcome, more disability. They were never meant. I talked um, for what they're used for now. I talked about this last year. Somebody's in a motor vehicle collision, and what do you do? You walk up to, they, set, up to them and say, sir, can you sit on my stretcher? And this was, this was studied. This was eight studies that were actually published where there were four last year, eight this year, where they actually took cameras and looked at people who had motor vehicle collisions, and they actually found they move less if they get up on their own and move on the stretcher than when EMS jumps in the car, you know, holds them in, in line stabilization, and then does a rapid takedown. So it really doesn't make sense what we do. It never really made sense. And for me, my policy is that if they have no neurologic disability, they're alert neuron times three, there's no drugs on board, um, and they have no significant distracting injury, I sit them up at 30 to 40 degrees, every single patient. And I would say, my goodness, we sit people up who have known back fractures with TLSO braces on at 30 to 40 degrees, why can't we set them up a little bit if we're not sure if they have back fractures, right? If they have neurologic disability or just significant distracting injury, I just slide them flat. But we know the best thing you can do for a patient is sit them up a little bit in every medical situation, right? The diaphragm goes down, the adipose tissue falls, it's easier to breathe, they have better, better pulmonary functional reserve when, 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 they, when they are sitting up, less chance of aspiration, it's much better to keep a patient sitting up at least 30 to 40 degrees if you can. Some people are writing 20 degrees, they're making that up. I'm making up 30 to 40 degrees because that's usually what we write on people's charts when they have known back fractures. Keep them up at least a little bit unless we have some known neurologic um, disability, distracting injury, or they're altered. Otherwise, we sit them up a little bit. Again, there are places around the country which don't put cervical collars on. Fresno, California, talked about this last year. If you get into NBC there for the last two, three years, you've got no cervical collars, no longboard period. And people are starting to do this. Now, when I came last year, or a year and a half ago, I was this radical guy who wanted to get rid of longboards. Now I'm amongst the majority, right? We adopted this in, in New Jersey. Basically, New Jersey just took my policy and, and implemented it for everybody, but it's just a guideline, so nobody has to follow it. We still have lots of first aid squads who refuse to follow this because they're afraid of being sued, the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard of. Many people have gone online now to say, your chance of getting sued is much higher if you put somebody on a longboard than if you don't put somebody on a longboard. So this idea of putting people on longboards is just yesterday's news. It doesn't make any sense. It's only good for extrication, not for transport. Do not strap patients. The, the cervical, the, the spine is curved. You cause more distraction of vertebral body fractures by putting them on long boards and strapping them in, and you delay care, and you delay care. 
So I'm glad this is over. ITLS, but the, the European standards have come out to say, let's get rid of cervical collars. I'm not ready to do that yet in New Jersey. I think that's probably the next step, but we're heading there. We're heading the day of getting rid of cervical collars because we can take type two odontoid fractures and perfectly place cervical collars. We actually distract the odontoid fracture. I just think it's been so ingrained in us, these cervical collars and long boards. Step one was to get rid of long boards. And step two is start to think about what to do with cervical collars next. But taping people to long boards, done, over, get rid of it, and help me help continue the fight for the few people left who still want to strap people onto these terrible devices. <coughs> Pete Bowles, so, Robbie, hard question? Go ahead, all yours. What about the views of KEDs or similar devices? Yeah, so my paper just came out on KEDs about two months ago in Western Journal of Emergency Medicine. I actually, I wrote, uh, it was finally published. I think I submitted it like two years ago to let you know how fast these things happen. And I wrote to the editor in chief of Western Journal of Emergency Medicine. I said, before you publish this, this is yesterday's news. I don't even believe in these devices anymore. And I'm publishing a paper on it so people aren't gonna believe this. And you know, the response was, well, it's a well-written paper. I said, thank you. Yeah, and he was trying to make me feel good. And he said, we're still gonna publish it. No, I'm not a believer in shortboards and, and, and CAD devices um, um, at all anymore. You know, I think it's delaying care, and I think there are healthy people who have two liters of blood in their belly, whose heart rates don't uh, go up and blood pressures don't go down, and we're spending too much time putting these devices on, and that's making them bleed more internally, and we just don't get too excited because we don't see the blood on the ground. So you've taken them out of your policies that you've taken them out as well? Well, I haven't taken them out because of the state requirements, so we still keep them on the ambulances and they collect dust. I'm not even sure most doctors or nurses would even know what to do with the kid if they saw one anymore. That's where the color Right. <laughs> the doctors are or yes. the patients are? Keep valves up EVM. I know some of you are doing this. I said this last year. If there's one thing I want you to do, I want you to run out today. If you don't have a peep valve on every BVM, you have to do this. This is an injustice. This is an injustice. It be, and why? Because if you do not put a peep valve on every BVM, you're only ventilating during 50% of the respiratory cycle. This is terrible. Every critical patient has to be on a high flow nasal cannula at least 15 liters per minute. If they have a CPAP on, they have to have it underneath their CPAP, and they have to have a peep valve. Because what happens if I take a BVM and put it over somebody's face and don't squeeze the bag? Nothing. When I squeeze the bag, the alveoli opens. And when I stop squeezing the bag in between squeezes, what happens? The alveoli snaps shut. And what makes it even worse is it makes it harder for the alveoli to open every single time afterwards. Subsequently, if you have a peep valve on with a high flow nasal cannula, that oxygen actually pushes against the alveoli and the peep valve and keeps the alveoli open during the entire exhalation phase. So now you're ventilating an oxygen better than, and you go from 50% to 100% and you save more lives. If you do not have a peep up on your BVM in 2016, you are behind the times. A couple of dollars, you will save more lives. Who is doing this on every BVM? Raise your hand proudly. All right. So you need a peep up. All right, high flow nasal cannula. By the way, when I was here last year, there were four studies on high flow nasal cannula. Now there's 10 studies. Their studies are even in the ICU. It's been shown better patient outcomes on multiple endpoints with high flow nasal cannula. High flow nasal cannula. If you are putting a laryngoscope in somebody's mouth without oxygen, that is insanity. That is taking the sickest patients and saying the sickest patients do not need oxygen. This, the first article was in December 2010, and it was called No DSAT. And trust me, if you put a high flow nasal cannula on critical patients, you will get denitrogenation, you will take these big bubbles, which we call lungs, get rid of all the nitrogen, fill them up with oxygen, and subsequently, you will not have desaturation. It's the best freaking thing in the whole world. You will have more time. Just think about this. For years, I did this too as a paramedic. I was crazy. I put a laryngoscope in somebody's mouth and I had no oxygen on them. But now what I do is I put an oxygen nasal cannula at least 15 liters in the hospital. I'm putting 25 liters by nasal cannula on them. This is not a new concept, by the way. Although the article in December of 2010 called No DSAT um, was one of the first published, we've been doing this in NICU babies for 30 years now. Now. In the NICU, we've been doing like high flow nasal cannula for kids with bronchiolitis in the NICU at 60 liters per minute. 
So if somebody tells you in your life that you can't put nasal cannula on more than six liters per minute, run away from that person. That is craziness. That makes no medical sense whatsoever. Do you know why they tell you six liters? Because somebody told them, and somebody before them told them, and the, and the person before them, nobody remembers who they were. Right? And that's why we don't do half of this stuff medically, because nobody relies on the science. We just rely on what some guy told me on a Saturday afternoon at the squad building. Right? No evidence base. So get your high flow nasal cannula, and I tell all the medics to put it on underneath the CPAP, because if somebody's on CPAP or BiPAP, and they get sicker, and you rip it off, you don't want to have to look around for a nasal cannula at that point when you're getting your Yankow ready, right? And you're getting your laryngoscope ready. The patient's already on a high flow nasal cannula. And if you take somebody on CPAP with 100% and you have nasal cannula on, you're going to start oxygenating more people better than ever before, right? So this is really, really important. Because the idea is not to bag patients. And I said this last year, and I'll say it even more. There's no new literature on this, but there's about 10 papers published. If you, the most dangerous device we have have on any ambulance, and this is probably going on YouTube, you can quote me, the most dangerous device we have on every, any ambulance, in any ICU, in any emergency department is the BVM. It's not the BVM, it's the BOD, it's the bag of death. There's nothing more dangerous. Squeezing the bag of death does four terrible things. One, it's simple. It opens up the lower esophageal sphincter, the tube that connects the esophagus to the stomach, and it increases your risk of aspiration. So when you go to intubate somebody, what happens? You start to vomit. It makes your intubation more difficult, right? If you stop bagging the way I was taught to bag like a crazy person, much, much fewer people will vomit on you. And dare I say, in some circles, nobody will vomit on you, right? It's amazing. Number two, it decreases blood flow to the brain. Did you know that bagging decreases blood flow to the brain? It actually decreases blood flow by, valves, by this valveless system, and there's a cerebral spinal fluid. Number three, it causes shunting. So you open out, you distend the alveoli too much. So we talked about not opening alveoli was very dangerous. Opening up too much is really dangerous. There's only two important things in the human body. Well, two and a half. One is the left ventricle. Two is the alveoli, right? Every Thursday night at my house is alveoli night. We all get together, we just study the alveoli because nothing's more important. And then the adrenal gland is the two and a half. <coughs> So you got to keep the alveoli open, but you got to keep it open the right amount. If you over distend the alveoli, you actually cause less oxygenation, less. And that's what squeezing the bag too aggressively does. It causes less oxygenation, right? <coughs> Nothing's more important. There's a big study in the England Journal of Medicine about a year or two ago, which you know, you know how everybody in the world has got like obstructive sleep apnea and uses a CPAP at night, right? So they did a study on obstructive sleep apnea patients, and they compared giving them, they compared giving them um, just a regular CPAP with CPAP at like two or three liters nasal cannula. And you know this, that, right? The one thing about structural subapnea is they get to hypoxic at night. And how do you think they did? The people who didn't get oxygen did better. Because adding oxygen is not the answer in these situations. Most important is keeping the alveoli open and oxygen is second. That's why the peep valve is really, really, really important. But don't over distend it. Don't bag like crazy. If your SAT's not lower than 93, CPAP is fine. And if you want to take CPAP, I can create CPAP in two seconds or less. I just take a high flow nasal cannula at 15 liters per minute. I put a peep valve on my BVM, and I got CPAP quicker than you can actually take it out of the bag. And that's it. And you just put it right over the patient's face. You don't squeeze the bag of death. We worry about things like epi and, 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 and lidocaine, amiodarone, and other drugs that don't help in cardiac arrest. But yet, we don't worry about squeezing the bag of death and making people worse and making them vomit. Less utilization of mechanical CPR devices unless the patients are being transported. So there's another study since I was here last year, the Vietnamese study. The Vietnamese study actually showed worse outcomes when people, people who had Lucas devices than people who got uh, manual CPR. Let me say that again, worse outcomes. So why is this? Why do people have worse outcomes? Well, they probably don't. I like these devices. There's four papers in the literature besides the Vietnamese study, which actually showed no benefit to these devices versus manual CPR. So if you think there's a whole bunch of literature out there, like most people do, that mechanical devices save lives, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Every paper that's ever looked at this shows no benefit. So 
Why is that? Because the average time period to put this device on is 36 seconds. So only one number I want you to remember, same number as last year from this, from this talk, and that's for every five seconds of interrupted compression, survival goes down by 17%. Take this home tonight, remember this, for every five seconds that you are not doing compressions, survival goes down by 17%. If it takes you 36 seconds, which it probably doesn't to put on a Lucas device, what does that do to survival? It's amazing anybody lives. So there are many studies out there that have tried to implement different strategies. One study just tried to get their uh, paramedics to put on the device really quickly and got them down to 10 seconds. That's pretty amazing. One system actually said, we're gonna put it on in two parts. We'll put it on the first part, and then when we're ready to transport the patient, that's when we'll put on the second part. One group of people actually said, we're not gonna put the Lucas device on or the autopulse until we're ready to transport the patient. And I think those are all reasonable strategies, but just so you know, although I like these devices because we all get tired of doing CPR and we all do terrible CPR carrying people downstairs, you know, these are not, if you're expecting these devices to save lives, we're probably doing the, expecting too much of them. Um, but nonetheless, I'm hopeful that if we get that 36 seconds down, we'll probably have some benefit in the literature. But even after all of these years of these devices being out, every study shows no benefit or worse outcome. Very, very interesting. Um, uh, I'll skip this. So routine chest decompression. So I just wrote a protocol. Actually, I didn't really write it. It was written 10 years ago, and everybody ignored it, like many protocols I write. Um, I, I'm a big believer. I did this when I was a paramedic. If you're a blunt traumatic arrest, you decompress both sides of the chest. No questions asked. Do not listen for lung sounds. Do not listen for lung sounds. Do not listen for lung sounds. Right? Hmm. So 30% of the time, we miss a pneumothorax in the trauma bay. When somebody gets into a bad trauma, or any trauma, and they have a pneumothorax, 30% of the time, we don't figure it out in the trauma bay by the x-ray or by clinical. We figure it out on CAT scan. Right? Now, which, which ones do we pick up? We pick up the ones that are very symptomatic or the ones that sound terrible by listening or the ones that are very impressive on x-ray, the subtle ones we generally miss. So what are the odds we can pick up a pneumothorax if somebody's on the roadside with a collapsed lung? It's, it's terrible. Sounds like a portable radio. It's terrible. It's terrible. So when somebody's in cardiac arrest from a trauma, from a blunt traumatic arrest, what's the chance you're going to, what's the chance you're going to survive? And the answer is you're going to have to find something that can be reversed very quickly. And one of the only things that can be reversed very quickly besides loss of airway is a pneumothorax. A tension pneumothorax where you decompress both sides of the chest. The good news is you can't be wrong. If the patient gets better, right, the doctors have to put a chest tube in. They can't tell if you did the wrong thing or not. They can't tell. So their patient's gonna get a chest tube. Is that fixable or no? The patient's going to get a chest tube no matter what. So it's very, very simple. And by the way, we're putting fewer and fewer chest tubes in across the country now with patients with pneumothoraces. We're putting in all these other types of fancy devices just to suck the air out, and patients are doing just as well. And we're finding you don't need a 40 French between your ribs to actually get rid of every pneumothorax. Just some, just a, just a hemothorax. All right. More sheets around pelvic trauma. I still think we don't do this well. I still think the paramedic books don't talk about this very well. I am a big fan of the T-Pod system, but the T-Pods are very expensive. That's a problem. So if you have pelvic trauma and you're bleeding into the pelvis, one of the most vascular places in the entire body, and you don't have T-Pods on your ambulance, the magical thing you have that's not perfect but not terrible is a sheet. So if somebody is a trauma patient with a significant trauma to their pelvis and their blood pressure isn't perfect, I put a sheet on 100% of the time and I squeeze it as tight as I can. And although it's not perfect circumferential pressure, it's better than nothing. So for some reason, I think we did an injustice in the paramedic textbooks just not talking about this enough, even in BLS. 
to do this all the time. The teapot's an expensive device. It looks like a little girl with like little strings and you size it to the patient. They're just not inexpensive devices. Um, there are other devices out there on the market too. That's one of the problems. But I think we don't address this enough, putting sheets on these patients. Um, I've seen patients trapped under cars for long periods of time with terrible blood pressures. I remember one girl, her systolic was 50 for like an hour trapped and, and nobody put a sheet around her pelvis. It really made uh, no sense and she came in shock, but she still had a good outcome. Early use of epinephrine. So we wrote an article about this this year. Uh, hopefully some of you read it. First of all, if you've ever seen, written, or given sub-Q epi, forget about it. All should be intramuscular. No epinephrine should be sub-Q. This is just another myth in medicine. Um, epinephrine IM works quicker. It's better. You don't need to give sub-Q epinephrine um, anymore for, for anything. This is actually not news. This data is 30 years old. We're just paying more and more attention to it. Benadryl is not a good drug for an allergic reaction. If you take oral Benadryl, you definitely need um, IV Benadryl. Oral Benadryl takes 100 minutes to get a steady serum state on average um, for an allergic reaction. IV Benadryl doesn't help. Antihistamines do nothing if somebody's short of breath. Let me say that again. If somebody's short of breath, antihistamines do zero. Zero, zero, zero. You need epinephrine. Any respiratory symptom needs epinephrine. Any respiratory symptom needs epinephrine. Benadryl does nothing. Antihistamines do nothing. Steroids have a lack of evidence-based literature for people who are having allergic reactions. We give them, but that's not based upon good science. And they work a little bit of four hours and work a tiny, tiny bit of two hours. But um, we give them, but epinephrine is what they need. If you need to repeat the epinephrine dose, um, obviously, you follow protocols to everything I'm saying, but if you need to repeat the epinephrine dose, that's really what they need. If you look at epinephrine failures, it's kind of interesting, epinephrine failures. Um, many epinephrine failures were actually, uh, if you look at every epinephrine failure, there have been papers written about this, they were almost all when the patient was lying flat, uh, not sitting up. The World Health Organization put out a statement that the patient's not critical. All epinephrine uh, should be given while the patient is sitting up, not lying flat. Uh, most allergists don't teach that to their patients, but that's what the World Health Organization actually has a position statement on. Um, less bagging, we talked about this, and no bagging if set's at least 93. If your set's at least 93, your pH is at least 60. You don't need to have it any higher. You do not need to have it any higher. If you, if you give oxygen for STEMIs and the set's greater than 93, that is totally incorrect. The AVOID trial, you can Google it, A-V-O-I-D, prove this, although there are several papers that were smaller. Chris Granger, who runs cardiology um, at Duke, is, uh, is a friend of mine. He's been going around the country for two years now telling people to stop giving oxygen for STEMIs. It makes people worse. Oxygen makes people worse if you give it for somebody who's having a STEMI of their sets at least 93. This is not controversial anymore. We know this. The big study called the AVOID trial um, actually showed they actually did PET scans of people's myocardiums and people who had STEMIs six months later had bigger myocardial infarctions, bigger if they got oxygen within 15 minutes of chest pain onset. That means what we're doing pre hospitally counts for STEMIs in terms of oxygen. And this is just another painful process of change. I know you don't give oxygen, then you get to some hospital and they go, you didn't give oxygen to a STEMI? You're like, are you crazy? And the answer is, I'm not crazy. I just pay attention to the literature. Although the literature is now two years old, I wish you would pay attention to the literature. Why? What? Why? Yeah, it's probably the same old argument, free radicals. Free radicals cause more ischemia, cause more vasoconstriction, and, cause bi and, and free radicalization over the next several days after a STEMI winds up causing, um, uh, winds up causing increased infarct size. So. But we're all taught this, right? I mean, I was taught this too, that every chest pain has to have like a non-rebreather. People ask me all the time, why do we get taught in EMT class um, that we have to put a non-rebreather on somebody uh, for chest pain? And I usually look at them and I go, I have no freaking idea. And it's because some, their, your instructor got taught this, their instructor got taught this, their instructor, and they say, well, we have to, it's part of the curriculum. And I go, excuse me, it's actually not a curriculum anymore, it's standards, right? And you don't have to, you know, teach this, right? Aren't they ischemic or no, are they chest What? Aren't they ischemic? Aren't, is that the reason why they're having chest pain? Yeah, but, but that's not true. For, so that may be true in hospitals. For us, our patients are having chest pain because they have their traumas, they have pneumothoraces, they have pneumonia, they have, you know, a, a million other, they have a PEs, right? What about cardiac ischemia that's proven by a 12 lead? Well, so, you know, if, if you believe that 50% of STEMIs are, show up on, um, 
12 is probably incorrect since our troponins got more sensitive in the hospital. We find there are a lot more people having n STEMI, so positive troponins with normal EKGs. So it's the, so we used to say that was true. In fact, we used to say that only 50, 50 it, it, STEMIs only show up on EKGs 50 percent of the time. Then somebody published a paper say it was 10 percent of the time. And then now we have good evidence to show that we have positive troponins. So somebody's having. Um, an N STEMI, meaning you know, a normal EKG with a positive troponin, <coughs> it's probably much worse than we ever thought. And that's what I think the biggest studies are showing now, that STEMI, the evidence of a STEMI and EKG is, is, is much lower than 50%. So we're going to have N STEMI centers now also? Yeah. Well, it's okay because everybody will, everybody will be an N STEMI center, right? If, we, if the guy across the street is to be a STEMI center, I do too. Right? When actually, if you look at STEMIs, what percent of chest pains make up STEMIs? It's probably somewhere about 5%, but it really depends upon where you are in the world, right? But that's okay because it's a low number. That's how we get away with having people doing direct cath lab activation from the field. If STEMIs made up 50% of the chest pain population, nobody would ever be a STEMI center because no cardiology group would ever be willing to give up 50% of their practice. They're willing to give up 5% of their practice because it's such a low percentage. So, uh, yes? Left yeah. And he's only getting 5% of the blood flow through. We don't want to oxygenate that as much as we Yeah, can. right. Isn't that insane? This is what I was taught. Well, Laurent, you guys taught this that there's a zone uh, of, of ischemia that surrounds a zone of infarct. And if you give oxygen, you reduce a zone of ischemia, it won't become a zone of infarct. And weren't you taught then had to answer question C at, on your EMT test? And let me tell you something it's totally wrong. <laughs> it's totally wrong, and, uh, but it's easy now. But last year, I just had to, I had to get up here and sweat about it, as I told you guys this. Now I can just tell you, Google the AVOID trial, A-V-O-I-D, and you'll see that it's not even new anymore. And then if you really look through the literature, this has been talked about for decades, but we don't pay attention to stuff where stuff appears in obscure journals until we finally figure it out. I'm going to show you an article, a key article that came out. If I maybe I'll show it to you next. Um, for us, and you know what journal the, the, uh, the article was in? Reproductive toxicology. Does anybody here get reproductive toxicology every week and read it? No, they don't. Let me, go, let me go right to that while I'm thinking about it. So if you don't know what happened to Zofran, Zofran is still my favorite um, anti-emetic. It's called the 5-HTC3 drug. And it's really good. Zofran, you know, Zo we ran out of IV Zofran nationwide a little bit, uh, like a, a year ago. And what did we start to do? We started to give in hospitals, we started to give Zofran ODT under the tongue. But for years we were taught you can never give anybody anything by mouth who's vomiting because it'll do something terrible. Uh, I don't know what that, what's it, what does that mean? Why don't we actually try and see what happens? These people actually got Zofran under their tongue. And you know what happened? They stopped vomiting. <laughs> and you know what? It was less expensive. And, we ran, and then we got IV Zofran back, and then there was this terrible study. And the terrible study was all over the popular media, and it said you can never give Zofran um, to pregnant women. So much so that a lot of OBGYNs stopped giving it. And if you don't know what a big problem hyperemesis gravidarum is, ERs are full with these women who are vomiting throughout their entire pregnancy like crazy. And they're on home pick line infusions of several different antiemetics, one sometimes being Zofran. But Zofran is a common drug that we give in the, in the pre-hospital setting around the world. And we had to be conscientious when this big study came out to say that you shouldn't be getting it if you're pregnant. What does that mean for us in the pre-hospital setting? We don't check pregnancy tests on anybody. But yet hospitals and OBGYNs were routinely discontinuing Zofran for all their patients. But yet nobody paid attention to us in EMS around the world to say, you guys should stop giving it too. So we kept giving it. In fact, by the looks of some of your faces, you didn't even know this was going on. And this all happened since I was here a year and a half ago. So all I kept hearing was, you guys in the ER can't give Zofran. You're going to get sued. She's pregnant. But nobody liked to talk to us in EMS. But that's OK, because just as much as there are studies to show one thing, now there are opposite studies to show. So this study, if you get reproductive toxicology, you know this. If you don't, you have to rely on a guy like me who looks through the literature every week to try and figure stuff out. And this was a study that everybody's talking about, but much less so than this study that we told us not to give it. And this study said it's perfectly safe in pregnancy. So now we don't have to worry about it, except most people will take a year or two to read this study and say that they can start giving it again. 
I thought the study that said it was wrong in pregnancy was just medically totally crazy. It used the same data set that said it was safe in the first line. This is my go-to drug for most people who are vomiting because I like the idea that you can give it under somebody's tongue. If you give somebody a medication sublingually, it bypasses first pass metabolism in your liver, so it gets absorbed in your bloodstream really quickly. And if you're vomiting, what do you want? You want the vomiting to stop, but you want it to stop quickly. You don't want to wait till a pill gets absorbed. You want it to be absorbed right away, so it was a perfect drug. All right, let's Zofran. Let's go back. Mark, there's a little question on, on, on uh, epimethamphylaxis. Yeah. If you have everything except for respiratory involvement, you know, well, maybe not, not hypothetical, but a lot of urticaria, urticaria, itchy, scratching throat, that kind of thing, flushed. Benadryl is for um, itching and rashes. Antihistamines are itching and rashes. Any respiratory <coughs> symptoms, antihistamines do nothing for. So my, my article this year was called, what do we call it? Epinephrine for anaphylaxis, underutilized and unavailable. And I got a lot of lay press. Because I believe that just like there are AEDs everywhere in the world, there should be epinephrine autopens everywhere in the world. You're more likely to need an epinephrine auto injector at the pool this summer than you are for an AED. So why is there, I'm not just agreeing that there shouldn't be an AED. I'm just saying there should be epinephrine there too. It makes no sense. We should train all these lay people. If you want to know what the penetration is in the school system throughout the country for ep uh, epinephrine auto injectors, it's terrible. Some school systems have it. Many kids experience their first bout of anaphylaxis at school, at school. You know, it, it's a completely underutilized thing. It should be everywhere in the world, just like AEDs are. And it's not. And I think we've really uh, missed the boat with, with this one. It's just something else that we should do, be doing a lot better. Um, there are still towns that where BLS doesn't have epinephrine auto injectors, right? All throughout. And there, 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 are, there are states where it's just not used uh, that much. Yes? Question from the audience was um, pelvic binding, if there's femur involvement, is that okay? Yeah, you know, th th this idea that you're going to bleed out from your pelvis uh, or bleed out from your femur is a little ridiculous. I mean, the, the instance of people exsanguinating from a pelvic fracture is definitely overstated in the literature. The odds that somebody exsanguinates from a pelvic, a broken femur, a broken femur without pelvic involvement is exceedingly, exceedingly, exceedingly rare, right? So I'm not that worried about a broken femur, even if it's open, your chance of bleeding internally and dying and getting hypervolemic from a femur, although possible, is exceedingly, <coughs> exceedingly, exceedingly rare. Pelvis is totally different. The pelvis is incredibly vascular. We always worry about it. The one place a trauma surgeon hates to be is in a bleeding pelvis. Bleeding pelvises go to IR, go to interventional radiology nowadays, and excuse me, we, tr we try and do procedures on them like embolization to stop their bleeding pelvis when they're hypertensive and sick. You know, give me somebody bleeding in the belly any day. These liver and spleens that bleed, they do great by interventional radiology, right? They do great, right? In fact, the old, the old dirty, um, the, 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 old, the old quick and dirty saying is, if you have like a, you take your liver lac, like if it's, and they're great for liver lacs and splenic lacs, and you take like, if it's grade two, you stay in the hospital three days. If it's a grade three, you stay in the hospital four days. So you get it, you just add one to the grade it is, and that's how many days we observe you for after your, with or without your interventional radiology procedure. So I had a kid who was playing hockey who got kicked in, 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 in the spleen. Mom brought the kid in, and six days later, because the pain was getting worse, the kid had a grade three splenic lac. So I stood there after years of training, very up in the literature, and said grade three <coughs> splenic lac. Three plus one is four. We'd normally be discharging him today from the hospital. He does have a splenic lac. He's stable. I could just tell mom that, yeah, your kid ruptured his spleen, but he's really fine. Take him home. And then I thought, well, there are a lot of lawyers in the world. And the lawyers wouldn't be as happy in that decision as I am. So I admitted the kid. And that was totally made up. And I mean, I would have taken my kid home because I would have known the chance of re-bleeding after those number of days is, is less than 1%. And none of the patients were, symptomatic, were, were asymptomatic when they rebled in, in every study. So um, was that answer your question? And can, and can a, uh, a hair traction? Yeah, uh, to, uh, so a hair traction for a femur. Uh, so we, we wrote an article about it this year that is really kind of absurd. Um, we don't think it really, you know, uh, it, it definitely helps pain. Head patients, literally, hip, fractured hips. 
So you mean hair traction for femurs? No, Kedra pelvis. Oh, Kedra pelvis. Oh, so Kedra pelvis is different. I mean, you want to put a Ked on a pelvis. Is that what you meant, Robbie, when you asked me about Kedra pelvis? No, I actually meant it for Ked for regular because of mobilization. But yeah. Ked for pelvis is different. So yeah, no, I think Ked for pelvis is fine. But, 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 Upside but, but I think that's fine. That's, my, that's Mark Merlin's opinion, not the literature's opinion, because we're going to separate them out tonight. But um, I, think, I think a Ked for pelvis makes fundamental sense to me. Um, would I have squads go out and buy Keds if they didn't for this purpose? No. I'd have them go get sheets, right? Or if they want to spend money on Ked, I would tell them to go buy a teapod. If you've never heard of a teapod, you should like Google it tonight. T-P-O-D. And it's really cool. It sizes up to the patient's pelvis. It's just too expensive for, for people to put on patients all the time. But it sizes. It's much better circumferential pressure. So I think, I think a Ked is fine. Yeah. How often are our pelvic fractures missed by EMS? And if so, would it make sense to like certain pedestrian trucks over a certain speed to automatically shoot them? With the double chest. So yeah, but, but, so, but right. I mean, how often are they missed? But the problem is, so, so I'll rephrase your question if I can take liberty to do so. How often are, are, are hemodynamically significant um, pelvic fractures missed? by, by, by uh, the emergency department, right? After they get like x-rays. And the answer is about three to 7%. So, but, but, but most of these just do totally fine, even without treatment. And there are a lot of pelvic fractures that are clinically insignificant where we do nothing about. I mean, you can, you know, you can fracture your ASIS. Um, you know, you can fracture several areas, several areas of your, of your pelvis where we do nothing about it. And we admit elderly people just for pain reasons and for physical therapy when there's no surgical treatment whatsoever. That happens all the time. And they just heal on their own, right? Um, and if you're younger and not in or significant pain, we say you broke your pelvis, go home, there's nothing to do, right? Um, what are we missing though, if I may, what are we missing? If you have a patient with a mechanism of injury and you immobilize them, how are we missing and what are we missing in a pelvic injury? We're hopefully going to monitor the vital signs to see if it's something. So you're not getting the compression, but in theory, what you know, Yeah, I mean, if they have a pelvic injury, but they're hemodynamically stable, they don't have uh, significant pain, and even no matter what the mechanism is, I, I, I wouldn't do circumferential pressure to them, right? Because the circumferential pressure applied right is probably going to not feel too good, right? Yes. Back on the subject of peep valves, can you clarify the use of peep valves for patients yeah. that are either extremely hypotensive or cardiac arrest? It's a good question. It's a good question. And I'll, I'll show you a paper that was out in New England Journal of Medicine. It was out this past December. It freaking changed the world of cardiac arrest. If you don't know this, December 2015, this guy named Graham Nichols published this amazing paper, the biggest trial ever on pit crew CPR. The only trial ever that was randomized on pre-hospital pit crew CPR. And you know what it basically said? It doesn't work. I know, you're gonna freak out, and we're gonna go through this trial because everybody's been talking about it. Because I've been saying, as much as the literature's been saying, you gotta do continuous compressions. You gotta do continuous compressions and you can't stop. So I have the article up, I'll show you in a couple of minutes and we'll, and we'll um, We'll talk about this. Now, to get to your question, if I have a peep valve on and the patient's systolic is less than 90, I tell EMS to put the peep valve on at five. If they're over 90, it's a critical patient in respiratory failure. Perhaps they're going to get intubated in a few minutes. Perhaps they're not, if they get better. If their systolic is greater than 90, I have them put on a 10. If they go into cardiac arrest, I have them take the peep valve to zero. And once they get ROSC, I have them put the peep valve back on at five if there's systolics less than 90, and 10 if they're greater than 90. It's hard to remember, right? It's not easy. But the question is, what's more important in cardiac arrest, forward flow or the alveoli being open? That's the question. Because the peep valve keeps the alveoli open, but when you add peep to somebody, you reduce preload. Now, if your peep valve, if your peep is at least is five, pretty much nobody, as every ICU doctor will tell you in the world, if somebody's on five of peep, very, very rarely does somebody become hypotensive with five of peep. But 10 of peep or, or more, they can. 
And we don't want cardiac arrest patients to become hypotensive. Because as I told you last year, and this is a, the second number I want you to remember, one in five patients go into cardiac arrest during the intubation period. Let me say that one more time because it's so important. One in five patients go into cardiac arrest during the intubation period. If you're hypotensive to start with, if your systolic is less than 90 when you're intubating, it's one in two. One and two. If you're making the decision to intubate somebody tonight whose systolic is 70, and I'm not saying you shouldn't. If it's indicated, do it. The chance of going into cardiac arrest is 50%. If it's somebody who already has bad vascular disease, what's the chance somebody's going to have a good outcome if they go into cardiac arrest? Right? It's not that good. In New York City, in, in all comers, so last time the data was published, it was 2.6%. The odds of, of, of walking out of the hospital alive in, in New York City with minimal to no neurological disability is 2.6% if you have a pre-hospital cardiac arrest. If you're watching a TV show, it's 90%, right? So our numbers are still, are still not good. Now, certainly if you take subsets like V-fib, V-fib is 10% to 20% depending upon where you are, depending upon a whole lot of other factors. But the problem is when you look at all comers, the numbers are bad because we have to include asystolic patients, people in PEA that we never figure out the cause. All these, you know, all, all, all big, people with big PEs, people with drug overdoses, et cetera, et cetera. So that's why I tell people to do with PEEP. And again, if you're in cardiac arrest, forward flow is more important, right? Potentially. So that's why we, we shut off the we, we shut off the um, PEEP valve because you need to keep forward flow open as much as you can. Before you go into cardiac arrest, the alveoli is more important than the left ventricle. That's why you put the PEEP valve on, you keep the alveoli open, and you oxygenate during all of exhalation. Once they get ROSC again, you go ahead and you put the PEEP valve back on. It's complicated, right? But I think this is where we were in 2016 with maneuvering of the PEEP valve before, you know, during respiratory failure, during cardiac arrest, and then during ROSC again. All right. Um, bypassing EDs for STEMIs is easy. We'll talk about TXA. So as you know, I am in love with TXA. There are 83 studies in the literature, 83 studies. 82 of them said it's great. One of them was equivocal. It was out of Ryder, Ryder Trauma Center. Now, if you are paying attention to the GEMS article that came out last month, I guess, by Adam Fox, who I know, he is a trauma surgeon who doesn't really like EMS and doesn't like TXA. He is in New Jersey. He trained at Penn, where they love TXA, by the way. And by the way, in his institution, uh, people get TXA for trauma. New Jersey has a statewide TXA protocol, which I wrote. And, um, but not everybody has to agree with me. It's like the great thing. Um, I mean, the people who don't agree with me are usually called wrong. <laughs> Even if they don't figure it out initially, they figure it out eventually. But TXA is a great drug. It's an antifibrinolytic. It works on lysine. It works on lysine. It's an antifibrinolytic. The military's been using it for 14 years. 14 years the military has been using it. I just sent two of my docs to the SOMA course. SOMA is this famous thing for tactical docs. And you know what they were suggesting in North Carolina for tactical EMS? To give it intramuscularly. I am TXA. Right, I am TXA. They want to give it to tactical police officers. So when they're bleeding out in dangerous areas, before EMS can get there, they inject themselves with TXA. The risk of giving antifibrinolytic is a DVT or PE. It's not true. It's not true because in all of these studies, they had no increased risk. The Pedtrex article, which was the pediatric TXA article, which looked at kids down to the age of three who got TXA, you know what they did with these kids? They gave them adult doses of TXA, 1,000 milligrams, 1,000. And you know what their instance of, was of DVT or PEs? Almost nothing. The problem with some of these studies, though, were that when you take patients and put them in bed and call them trauma patients, and trach them and put in pegs, they get DVTs and PEs. So when you look at this, it's really hard to dissect out some of this data. But all I can tell you is the literature is overwhelmingly positive. I love this. The New Jersey Trauma Council loves it because they agreed with me and decided to have a protocol for TXA. 
Seventy-five percent of the, of the uh, paramedic units in my, in my state have um, ha have TXA, and I think this is really important. If you have a trauma <coughs> patient who's bleeding, giving them TXA will save their lives, and I think it's standard of care. Um, I, I say that very boldly that I think giving TXA is, is standard of care. But if you're a few minutes from a trauma center, you don't have to give it. In fact, even our protocol says. Um, any, if somebody's in trap less than 20 minutes or you're within 20 minutes from a trauma center, you probably don't need to give it, right? But certainly if somebody's entrapped in a pre-hospital setting and they're bleeding, you have very little to offer them. What do, you, what do we have to offer an EMS for a bleeding pelvis or intra-abdominal bleeding? Fluid. Nobody bleeds normal saline, do they? Anybody here bleed normal saline or lactated ringers? Normal saline, this is Ken Mannix's data, normal saline, what does it do? It dilutes out clonic factors and makes people bleed more. This is one reason why we stopped putting mass trousers in everybody. We were causing more bleeding. So I give fluids for people whose systolics are less than 90 because I don't know what else to do with them. I'm probably not doing the right thing. Permissive hypotension is probably a very reasonable thing, and there's better outcomes <coughs> with lots of people who remain hypotensive. They looked at this for GI bleeds, and they looked for GI bleeds who has better outcomes, people who keep their hemoglobin at seven or nine with, when they get transfused. People whose hemoglobins were seven and not transfused till they were seven had better outcomes when they were transfused when they were nine better outcomes. And why is that? Why did all the world GI experts say this is happening? And the theory is that through your portal circulation, you probably get more hypertension and cause more bleeding by giving fluids too early when you're anemic from GI bleeding. Kind of interesting, huh? So a little hypotension is not the worst thing in trauma. A little anemia is not the worst thing for GI bleed. Now, the Conklin database is the biggest evidence-based collection of literature we have. In, if you want to know any question in medicine, you just go to Cochrane. Cochrane's looked at like a thousand different concepts in medicine. So it's your easiest way to look at all the published and unpublished articles about any topic. They looked at upper GI bleeding. And initially, they were against giving TXA, and now they're for it. So for significant upper GI bleeds, there's a, whole, there's a body of literature. I wouldn't say it's the strongest literature in the world, but it exists about giving TXA for upper GI bleeding. There's now several, a couple of papers, I think three papers in the literature about giving TXA for nosebleeds. TXA for nosebleeds. So you take your four by four, you put TXA on it, and you stick it in the nose. There was just a doctor, we do this journal club every week. We invite doctors from all hospitals. One doctor at a community hospital reported an elderly lady who fell down several flights of steps, came uh, inappropriately to his hospital. He was transferring, got, had a lot of bad trauma. He was transferring to another hospital. While he was waiting for the transfer, her gums were just bleeding like crazy. She was on Coumadin, but she had like several lacerations to her gums. So he took a bunch of four by fours, because she was getting ready to intubate her. Took a bunch of four by fours, poured TXA on it, and packed her mouth. Then he did what nobody should do, and he acknowledges this. He looked to see if it was still bleeding. So he took all the four by fours out, and there was zero bleeding. Zero freaking bleeding. He was getting ready to intubate this old lady who fell down steps, and there was zero bleeding. TXA is a great drug. You have, you, the side effect profile is great. Unfortunately, in the GEMS article, they picked on the Ryder study, which is a equivocal study, where uh, it had several problems with it, with it. And by the way, the authors of the Ryder trial acknowledged there were several problems with their paper. And I thought they did a very good job. And it was a very biased article. And I think of the 80 comments, including one that I made, um, where I offered to Gems to write a rebuttal, um, as several people did. And Howie, Howie, um, Howie Melk, Howie Mel, who's a famous um, 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 uh, physician who writes a lot of stuff on social media for EMS. He, he, I can't quote him, I can't quote anybody better than his quote on the EMS listserv, and he said, this is gobbledygook. This is one of the worst articles ever published in GEMS, in the history of GEMS. So there, of all the um, comments, most just thought it was just a terrible article. And, so, and by the way, since that was published, just so you have to be careful what you published, there was the best pre-hospital TXA study ever published. I sent it out on my listserv, which goes to 7,200 people um, once a week, although I forgot to do it yesterday. Um, and 
the TXA article, this article said that everybody in pre hospital setting should be getting TXA when it's clinically indicated. Right? So it's the opposite of what he said. And I mean, it's a fantastic drug. Uh, I would give it to more people. Yeah, so they were talking about it. I, mean, I actually spoke to. Um, I actually spoke to Brad Hoffman about this a couple of months ago. I forget exactly what he said, but I can ask him again. I'll get back to you. Um, you, you know, the one thing about TXA, it's almost a perfect pre-hospital drug. One, Novo 7, which was the precursor, which the military used 14 years ago and gave to everybody young, cost thousands of dollars per dose. For, for my physician vehicles in New Jersey, I pay $450 for 10 vials, and it's one vial per use. It's $45. The drug doesn't degrade by temperature, right? So it's used in really hot climates, really cold climates. And motion doesn't degrade the drug that much either. So the moving ambulance doesn't degrade the drug. It's almost a perfect pre-hospital drug. And you give 1,000 milligrams over 10 minutes. We used to think that you couldn't give in subarachnoid hemorrhages. That was proven not to be true. There's actually one paper that which looked at intracranial bleeding and showed better outcomes with people who got intracranial bleeding when they got TXA. So that's TXA, nothing but good things to say about it. Um, all right, so we know if people are having STEMIs, if people are having STEMIs, they should go to the cath lab. What about the people who are in cardiac arrest? If you're in cardiac arrest and you get ROSC and you're having a STEMI on your 12 lead, it's the same thing, you should go to the cath lab. What about people who are in cardiac arrest and have 12 leads that don't show STEMIs? Should they go to the cath lab? Well, in the past year, this has been many, many healthy debates. And the best article and best review, which was out of Houston by this brilliant cardiologist, said, in his opinion, and he quoted several articles, 30% of people in cardiac arrest are found to have culprit lesions causing STEMIs with normal EKGs after cardiac arrest, 30%. So would you go to the cath lab for a, card a cardiac arrest patient with ROSC and among 30% are having STEMIs? The answer is, I probably would. And number two is, I'm also gonna find lots of other terrible diseases. Like some people who might be having dissections, I'll figure it out right away. Even some people having PEs, I might get hints of PEs if I go to the cath lab right away. So it's probably pretty reasonable. But is it, are we capable as a society to bring every cardiac arrest patient to the cath lab right away with a normal EKG? And the answer is, of course not. But we can't take everybody who's got uh, terminal diseases and bring them to the cath lab when we know there'll be bad outcome. But what about that guy who's 40 or 50 who goes into cardiac arrest and has a normal EKG? Do they belong in the cath lab? There's a whole wave of people who are saying yes right now in the literature. But this is not, you know, community hospitals can't do this, right? Community hospitals where they have two or three interventional cardiologists who are at home can't be driving into the hospital for every cardiac arrest or they'd have to live in the hospital. And we don't pay people, we don't pay interventional cardiologists to stay in the hospital 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But this is being talked about in the literature. And I think it's a really good, healthy debate. Yes? You go bypass a regular to a cath lab in a patient with not a STEMI after a ROSC? Yeah, it's a hard question to answer. And some people say, well, what, what do you, you know, do I, would I do this for my family members or would I do this for me or would I do this for patients? You, you know, when we make decisions for large groups of people, it's, it's oftentimes difficult because if I said yes to that, then, you know, most of what um, the America is are community hospitals in rural areas. They're not New York City, they're not LA. You know, they're not New Jersey, they're middle America, where they cath people with no cardiac surgery backup for hundreds of miles. You know, they, cath, they, they, do, they, they, they have cath labs in little, in, you know, in, in office areas, and surgery centers, right? So it's not like we have, you know, great access in most of middle, middle America. So I think creating such a protocol would be a little bit dangerous. You know, what we can do as an, um, a happy medium, which is another uh, place people are writing articles about, is you can actually take that patient who gets ROSC and do a quick echo on them. Every ER doctor should be trained to do an echo now in the emergency department, uh, and most people who are graduating programs are. You can do a quick echo, and if, if you see an isolated warm motion abnormality, then you can take them to the cath lab. Somebody will argue, well, I don't know if that's new or old, that's okay. 
right? So you're gonna have a few people who have old warm motion, isolated warm motion abnormalities, and they'll go to the cath lab, that's okay. I certainly think it's reasonable, you can pick up some disease. Do we have studies where we compare people to going to the cath lab right away uh, versus uh, delayed cardiac arrest with normal 12 leads? Not that I'm aware of, no. What about neurological studies in these post-arrest patients? Do you look at it or just look at it? Say it again? In yeah, I mean, most neurologic, uh, the problem is neurologic status. We had one of the other neighborhoods, we had a post-arrest that had a STEMI, but uh, the cardiac fellow refused to take it to the cath lab because he was fixed and dilated, and the paramedics were very upset. Yeah, but a lot of our patients are fixed and dilated, right? Right, a lot of our patients are fixed, I mean, what, was the patient breathing over the vent at all? I mean, if the patient was breathing over the vent at all, if the patient had some brainstem activity, I would say it's reasonable. Listen, you know, you, you can always stop at um, CAT scan on your way to the cath lab. We do that sometimes and see if there's a big bleed as a cause for the cardiac arrest, see if there's early evidence of anoxic brain injury um, uh, on, the, on the CAT scan. So we, we do that sometimes. Uh, you can do a diffusion scan sometimes to see what blood flow there is. But usually, you know, most people who get ROSC have some sort of neurologic evidence after ROSC. If you really have zero, and you really have your pupils are not responsive, and you're not breathing at all over the vent despite nothing being uh, nothing being on you, you know that's that's a, a healthy debate because you can't bring all those patients to the cath lab um, because you won't be benefiting anybody even if you open up the coronary arteries. Will most patients with ROSC have a STEMI anyway? Will most patients with ROSC have a STEMI? Um, some do, some don't. No, I mean, nowadays with all the drug overdoses we're getting and all the people coding. Because they did have, MI, they did arrest, they could have had the study prior and so it would show up that they had a study. But we have many, many patients who, who get ROSC after cardiac arrest who have no, who, who um, I mean, just like you have people who have um, abnormal EKGs that look like STEMIs, you take them to the cath lab and they have no culprit lesion. It's very confusing. I think the interventionalists have confused us a little bit because they take people to the cath lab and they bring back these cath lab pictures which show a 95% lesion and that they've stented. Well, well, that's got nothing to do with his STEMI. That's 95% 95% lesion, 95% cheeseburgers, right? And they stumbled across that, right? But I want to know if there's a culprit lesion. I want to know if there's an acute plaque rupture which caused the guy's STEMI. And much of the time, there's not. Sometimes there is, sometimes there's not. But a healthy amount of the time, and I don't have the numbers to tell you, a healthy amount of the time, people will say there's no culprit lesion. So why did the guy code? Well, he coded because he had a ventricular arrhythmia, right? And he went to VF. He coded because he got hypoxic. He coded because he had worsening pulmonary edema. He coded because of all the other million reasons that people code. Yeah. Question from the live blog. What does Dr. Rowan feel about pointer care bedside cardiac enzymes in an effort to expedite their care in the URL? I love it. <laughs> I'm crazy about it. A good pointer care troponin test is fantastic. Um, you know, it, it, it helps push people into the cath lab with positive troponins with normal EKGs. A 12 lead is only so good, right? If you have a STEMI on your 12 lead, okay, you belong in the cath lab. If you have a, don't have a STEMI on your 12 lead, Okay, maybe you belong in the cath lab. Now I gotta wait for the troponin, see, see, see what it is, and, and make some decision about when this patient's going to go. But we need more objective criteria, right? We need more objective criteria. The 12 lead, we're relying on a test that's far from perfect to figure out if somebody actually has, has a culprit lesion or not. So I think a point of care troponin is perfect. You know, my problem is I, I used to carry iStat machines on the physician vehicles. The problem we found were they're not very good in big temperature extremes. So, um, so we take them like, like big events, like marathons and stuff, um, where we temperature control them. But if we keep them in like vehicles that are not temperature controlled, um, you know, they, they stop working. And the other problem is they're not clear when they're clear your model is. You have to have a moderate lab status. And using them in the vehicles, you just can't drive around with them. Oh, right, well, some are clear, some are clear away, some are not, right? For not for troponin, right, right, for other things, yeah. The question was troponin. Right, right. So not for troponin, and you can't find anything for um, lactic acid either. Right. Anything. Right. Uh, the old lactic acid argument. I'm so. Putting it out there. Right. That there are regulatory issues that don't allow us to do everything. There's been a whole bunch of sci uh, literature about pre-hospital lactic acids. 
You know, lactic acids help identify sicker patients. Some are septic, some are absolutely not septic, as the resident who called me a couple of days ago was having a vomiting and diarrhea whose lactic acid was 2.6. He was 25 years old, he had nothing wrong with him except he had a stomach virus, and his lactic acid was 2.6. He didn't need anybody to get too upset about it. I got upset about the other resident who sent the lactic acid in the first place for somebody with vomiting and diarrhea um, because they're sending it on everybody. But you never want your test to be too sensitive, and, and that's, uh, that's the problem, in my opinion, with the lactic acid, that's too sensitive. So we're picking up most people with, with sepsis, but that's because we've set the bar too, right? Uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not surprised, right? No, but the, 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 you're saying four, but there are people who publish papers now on two. And I was just, there was some EMS conference, where was it? I can't remember where it was, but I was lecturing there. I'm not even sure what state it was in. And, um, and, and I'm sitting there and they're, they're talking about doing two. And I'm thinking, I'm two right now. You know, I don't need like a septic, a septic workup. The, you know, the, they're identifying they have a, a test that's too sensitive, and that's not a good thing either. Right, the standard sepsis criteria, um, the old SERS criteria w w was for, again, it's just helping you pick up sicker patients. So, I mean, if somebody's got a lactic acid of nothing, you know, that makes you feel a little bit better, and that's all it does. Right, it doesn't make you say the patient's not sick, it just makes you feel a little bit better. And every now and then you get a lactic acid that's high, and you go, is this patient sicker than I thought? And that's all it is. It doesn't really tell you what's wrong with anybody. And it's one of the many sepsis criteria, right? All right. Um, uh, I'm a big believer in that uh, event medicine. People are writing textbooks about it now. We're finally getting, I think, to a good place that we're treating some of these events um, unlike MCIs, where we're creating like little like EDs and urgent care centers and we are taking care of people and suturing them and doing all these great things for people without rushing everybody to the hospital, inundating hospitals every time we have um, some sort of uh, mass gathering. And that's, uh, that's really important. All right, if you've ever learned, which I'm sure you have, because I learned it, and I wrote, we wrote a whole paper about this because some paramedic brought in a patient who was on DIG, who had a wide QRS complex, and um, the doctor ordered IV calcium, and the ER doctor said to the paramedic, it's a good thing you didn't give it, you probably would have killed the patient. Because there's this belief in medicine by a lot of people that you cannot give IV calcium to somebody who's potentially hyperkalemic if they might have DIG toxicity. So that means if somebody's on DIG, and you worry about hyper, and of course the one drug you want to give somebody who's hyperkalemic or suspected hyperkalemia is calcium. There's this belief. This belief is just another insane thing that we teach people. The literature does not support this. We wrote a paper about this. This is just ridiculous. But if you ask most physicians, they will tell you that this is what they learned and they will teach this to you. Despite a clear, overwhelming lack of evidence, and I believe this is perfectly safe, so much so that when a paramedic unit calls in to our control and says the patient has a new onset, significant bradycardia, we're routinely giving calcium. Why? Because hyperkalemia can cause significant bradycardia. Third degree heart block, second degree type two, or just basic significant size bradycardia. Hyperkalemia can cause bradycardia. Some of these patients are having significant bradycardia from hyperkalemia. And so they need calcium. They don't necessarily need atropine at all. What's the risk of giving calcium? Zero. What's the benefit? I'll resolve the bradycardia in seconds. What's the dosage A thousand milligrams IV calcium chloride. There are still doctors out there who believe that you can't give calcium chloride to peripheral lines. I was stopped recently by a nephrologist who said, Mark, what are you teaching these residents? They're giving calcium chloride uh, to people peripherally. And I said, really? I said, so do all the paramedics in the entire world. And I said, and number two is, it's on every code card in every hospital in the world. But sure enough, in the textbooks, for years and even still today, it talks about that you shouldn't give calcium chloride intravenously. Calcium gluconate is not a good choice for us in the pre-hospital setting. Number one, it's got three to four times less elemental calcium as calcium chloride. 
And number two, calcium gluconate causes hypotension, right? It's a glucose molecule. Through osmosis, it causes hypotension. You don't want to give somebody calcium gluconate. You don't want to risk the hypotension. If somebody's in the hospital, you know their calcium, their calcium is a little bit low, can you give them calcium gluconate? Sure. But in a crisis situation, give them calcium chloride every single time. I just got called by um, a nurse who said, um, hey, uh, one of the paramedics brought in a patient and they were in AFib and they got cardizam and the paramedic gave them IV calcium too. Why would they do that? So it's kind of funny because when I was a paramedic, this was our protocol. Every time we gave somebody a calcium channel blocker, we give them 1,000 milligrams of calcium chloride every single time. Because when you give somebody a calcium channel blocker who's in like rapid AFib, it's either going to block the AV node first or it's going to vasodilate the first and cause more hypotension. And the theory is you'll, you'll block the vasodilatation and just block, block the AV node um, quicker and subsequently reduce the chance of getting hypertension. The literature is not that great either way. So if somebody does it, I say fine. If somebody doesn't do it, I say fine too. This is, there's a couple of studies out there which said this probably helps very, very few people, but it's something to consider. Ketamine, 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 ketamine. Uh, my docs last year who graduated fellowship, they gave me a big sign that says more ketamine for everybody. And that's probably true. Ketamine, you know, ketamine for seizures. Some doc called me at a hospital, said, we seasoned kidding, your paramedic gave ketamine, I've never heard such a crazy thing. And I sent them the 15 articles published about ketamine for seizures. Um, ketamine is a great drug. It's a great drug for seizures. It's a great, great drug for mostly refractory seizures, not as, as first line, but that may change down, down the future. Uh, ketamine for violent patients will be the first drug I go to for anybody violent. Um, four milligrams per kilogram intramuscularly, a higher dose than you're giving to intubated patients, but you're giving intramuscularly. If you want somebody to dis disassociate quickly and for a quick response, consider I am ketamine. The Miami study was done which looked at giving ketamine to violent patients, and uh, almost 36% of the time, they needed to give a backup benzodiazepine. But benzos are not good drugs for violent patients. You know this, they're too titratable, they don't work very quickly. I, if I get somebody really violent, I want to stab them with one drug, one time, and then have them calm down uh, enough so I can put an IV in. Maybe they have excited delirium, maybe they're just a violent patient, but ketamine is a great choice, cause dissociation. You really can't overdose on ketamine, and the most, you can do some damage by giving it too quickly. You don't have to worry about that intramuscularly, but there's some, some risk of give, causing laryngospasm for people who get ketamine uh, IV push too quickly. My first line agent now for induction uh, is ketamine is my first line induction agent. Atomidase is a terrible drug for sepsis, hypertension, and trauma. Terrible, terrible <coughs> drug. It causes some degree of adrenal insufficiency, has several other bad things associated with it. So I'm not a big fan of Atomidate for those. If you want to give Atomidate for everything else, I think that's okay. Uh, I don't think there's any terrible literature, and I think there are lots of healthy debates in literature about what the best drug is, but specifically for septic patients or people who are hypotensive with trauma, uh, I, I think uh, ketamine wins. It's, it's a myth in medicine that we proved last year by this guy named Cohn, published a study in, in Isles of Emergency Medicine, which actually showed that ketamine you can certainly give in head trauma. That's a complete myth. We totally missed the boat on that. They pulled all the papers ever published on this. Just as many people have decreasing ICP as increasing ICP. And who really cares that much about ICP? What counts in life is cerebral perfusion pressure. As cerebral perfusion pressure does not get worse with ketamine. In fact, it's better in most studies. It's better in most studies. And they've taken people with big, bad, huge brain tumors. And just as many people get worsening ICP as improving ICP. Right? So the idea that you can't give it is really just a myth that we're slowly, slowly getting away from. But I can tell you that even though there are people who still believe this in the United States, there are other countries that have been given ketamine um, IV for head trauma for decades, for decades. And I think what we do in the United States with restricting it for head trauma is absurd. So, yeah. so the fact that you said that led me into, I have a friend who has a friend who knows somebody who's a paramedic. <laughs> and uh, they had a patient. It's just a true story. They had, they had a patient who was septic and happened to be hypotensive as well. So IV fluid was run, normal saline, whatever it was, and uh, she had to be intubated. So they went with the Tomidate. So basically what she's saying is that, first of all, I think they also told me they ventilated before they intubated. So that shouldn't have been done as well, and her saturation was 100% the entire time. 
So moving on from the uh, ventilations prior to intubation and no nasal cannula, so the atomidate would have been a bad choice because she was septic. And you would rather have gone with the... Uh, yes. I have to call him and tell him. <laughs> Did he yeah. have ketamine at the time? I have to call so, him. So the other thing ketamine does is it raises your blood pressure, right? Ketamine raises your blood pressure. Right? So why give a drug where there's some chance of some people getting adrenal insufficient? A nice healthy debate, but people who are septic in those subgroup analysis across the entire body of literature, not just one paper, tend to do worse with, uh, with, with Atomidate. Although there's some studies to say there's minimal effects, some studies that say no. The majority of the literature says that uh, Atomidate has a worsening outcome with people who are, who are septic or, or hypertensive due to trauma. So ketamine is a great induction agent <coughs> choice. Um, listen, we, somebody just, I just, somebody, a resident just told me a story about somebody who got intubated only with lidocaine spray. And they asked this anesthesiologist, why'd you do that? This anesthesiologist said, I've been doing this for 30 years, and this is all I use. I mean, I don't know what to say, but um, we've shown that you have better outcomes in people who get paralytics and induction agents and better first pass if you give these drugs. Is that necessary for somebody who's been doing it 30 years with no problem? Maybe not. But there aren't too many of us in the pre-hospital setting which have done nothing except intubation for 30 years. I mean, we do intubation, but we do other stuff too, right? So uh, besides, you know, a, a patient who needs to be intubated in an OR setting is much different than our patient, right? So uh, I, I love ketamine, it's a great drug. I'm putting people on ketamine drips now. What it's getting, for uh, I'm giving two per kilo, although I think if you start at one per kilo with some patients, it's probably okay. So I give two per kilo, I give, I give one to two per kilo before, and I give one to two per kilo afterwards. Obviously, yep, and I give fentanyl with it. Because fentanyl, no, no drug is more important than pain medicine for the intubated patient, right? Pain first, and this is just, I'm quoting Weingart here, so I'll give him credit. If you're intubated, pain first, sedation second. Pain first, fentanyl. You can give another pain medicine too if you have fentanyl. And number two is sedation. All right. It being intubated just plain hurts. Besides needing sedation, it, does, it causes pain to have a tube in your throat, right? It's common sense. So fentanyl, 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 and fentanyl helps with my ICP for somebody with head trauma as well. So you're if you're, Bogle what? You're calling Dr. Bogle Bogle. Say it again? You're calling Dr. Bogle Methodist Quinn? Yeah, yeah. So I give, I give fentanyl three mics per K for head trauma, and then I give one to two post intubation. And in the hospital, I put everybody on a fentanyl drip who's intubated because you should never remember being intubated on the ventilator. And then ketamine drips are very, in fact, there was just an ICU study out two weeks ago which called ketamine the future standard of care for every um, ICU patient um, and, and argued that this is what everybody should be on an ICU. Um, and maybe that's true. Ketamine since last year, the literature has exploded for the psychiatric community, exploded. There's so much ketamine. There's a study out to show that if people get ketamine one dose after induction for an RSI, it helps their depression scales for one month after the intubation. There are people now in the psychiatric community who are bringing patients in to get intranasal ketamine two, three times a week to help with depression. Intranasal ketamine. It's helping with depression for months and months and months. And you can't overdose on these, so. Yeah, there's really no overdose on ketamine. I mean, we, we start with four. There are people actually giving up to seven in the literature in meta-analysis, but they've compared multiple places around, around the country. There are people giving much higher doses of ketamine. I mean, if I have to um, amputate somebody's arm pre-hospitally, the first drug I'm reaching for is ketamine, because I want to control my airway, not have to worry about that, and I want to, disso to dissociate the patient immediately from their pain. I want them to be awake, Airway protected, and I want them to be able to look at it and not feel the pain. Sure. Plus, it helps the depression when they use their arm. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing ketamine does, by the way, is ketamine helps pain by itself. So now there's a bunch of literature on ketamine for people in sickle cell crisis. There's a bunch of literature on, on, with people getting ketamine just for pain. Ketamine at the 0.3 per kilo dose, so lower, lower dose, tends to help just for pain crises. So if I give somebody pain at one or two per kilo, it's helping the pain 
right? It's helping the pain, the ketamine, it's helping the pain. So it's really this amazing drug. Um, I think it's great. The literature's gonna keep popping up. But you know, some people, it takes years to come around, right? We just, it was just a patient in ICU in New Jersey, and I was just, I was following their notes in the ICU every day, because it was a, a cardiac arrest. It was a case, it was a case, it was a rough case. Uh, the patient came in and actually uh, was a heroin overdose, coded while being pulled, be, being brought in, was being brought in by BLS only because the patient was supposedly awake at the scene. They're wheeling the patient in and the patient basically codes just wheeling the patient in. I thought the patient was 32, so it was my case. I mean, there were a lot of residents, but it was my case. The pa I thought the patient was 32 because there was no family. Turns out the patient was 52, but I didn't learn that after, till afterwards because all I heard was no significant past medical history and he looked pretty young. So the guy codes in front of us. So we, we start to, so we, we're thinking we're in this for the long haul, right? If this is a long code, we're gonna code the guy for a long time because he coded in front of us. So. He, he, we code him for 45 minutes, 45 minutes, a long time, couldn't, couldn't get the guy to break uh, VF. We, we shocked him about 20, 30 times, the last 10 of which were double sigma defibrillation. So we took two defibrillators, we took two uh, life pack 15s, uh, with four pads, 720 joules, right? If you pay attention that we published the second paper ever, in all the literature about double sigma defibrillation last month in pre-hospital emergency care, and we, and we finally got ROSC at the 45 minutes. But our ROSC was a blood pressure of 50 over 30 with a heart rate of 40. At this point, we had him on epinephrine drip wide open and leave it fed at 25. Solid, big, big doses of pressors. Take an, an ultrasound machine, look at his left ventricle. His left ventricle is squeezing. So now, what would you do if you were me? I'm sitting there going, 45 freaking minutes, this guy was down. Uh, his pressures are wide open. His blood pressure is nothing, but his left ventricle is still squeezing a little. His end tidal CO2 is about 20, uh, but during the code, it would go from 20 to 40. Somebody doing good CPR, 40. Some doing bad, somebody doing bad CPR, 20. And now we get ROSC. And I'm thinking what's probably gonna happen, which happens to most patients, is he go he's gonna code again, right? But he doesn't. He doesn't code again. <laughs> So I get a blood gas, right? Because now it's time to start thinking, what do I do? Because one option is just to pronounce the guy dead. His heart, his blood pressure is 50, because I'm thinking big picture here. Big picture is 45 minutes, he's got anoxic encephalopathy, he's gonna go to the unit, ICU, for weeks, and then finally die in three or four weeks. But his left ventricle is squeezing. So now I try and justify my decision by doing a neuro exam on the guy. His pupils are reactive. <laughs> And he's breathing a little bit over the vent. So my next question is, is that brainstem activity, right? right? Or is this like real neurologic function? So, <laughs> so what I did was, I said, let's do ECMO on the guy. Because I still thought he was 32. He was young, so we put him on ECMO. His blood gas comes back, and his pH is 6.83, and his PCO2 is 102. You might be saying that's terrible. I don't know, a guy's been in cardiac arrest for 45 minutes. It's not good, but for a guy in cardiac arrest for 45 minutes, I guess it could be worse. So, so we put him on ECMO, and what happens on ECMO? Well, his blood gas becomes completely normal in a couple of minutes, right? That's easy. Because his left ventricle was squeezing a little bit, we decided to put him on VV ECMO, not VA ECMO, right? And so we get everything normalized in a couple of minutes. Three weeks later, he's in the unit with doing uh, almost nothing neurologically except some myoclonic jerks, still alive, perfect blood pressure, right? What did I do for his rate? Uh, well, we, start, we just started giving him, we, we just started pushing multiple amps of bicarb because I had nothing really else to offer the guy and I knew that once he was on ECMO for a couple of minutes, um, the rate would come up because his rate was probably so low because of severe, I mean, we gave him like lots of calcium. I mean, we, we had epinephrine wide open and we had, um, we, we had levofed at 25, so good doses. Um, so I also knew when we could, could correct the severe acidosis, his rate would probably normalize. And sure enough, in a couple of minutes it normalized. But all, that, all this says is, you know, we have the ability to correct people's numbers. But now it's a couple of weeks later, he's still, 
um, you know, basically doing almost nothing neurologically. He's having multiple seizures, which is a big problem because he's been on five um, anti-epileptic meds. And if you're still seizing after five medications, that basically is a bad a sign of very bad outcome. So I'm left with the, the, the question, did I do the right thing by not pronouncing the guy dead when he was 50 over 30 with a heart rate of 40 and, and not doing ECMO? And this is what we're talking about now in the literature, about doing ECMO on some of these people. You know, Hershey has um, a program where they can hit a button on the wall in Pennsylvania and they can start doing ECMO on these cardiac arrest patients. I, I just spoke to um, some people at uh, Newark Presbyterian and they were telling me about like an ECMO protocol where they're not for their hospital, I mean for their hospital, but also if they're training mul multiple people in other hospitals as well. Um, France and Germany do pre-hospital ECMO, and they published their data recently, and they had terrible outcomes with doing ECMO in the pre-hospital setting. Um, I don't know. You know, I, yeah, you know, I, I think if you have a really a viable patient, it's great, it's fantastic. Forty-five minute downtime. You know, I mean, lots of people could benefit from ECMO. The question is, are those people the ones who have been in cardiac arrest for a long time who now have ROSC? And again, the patient with no comorbidity who's young sounds reasonable. But, you know, my guy was young with no significant comorbidity, but he had been down 45 minutes, but he was still having some neurologic function, although I didn't know if that was brainstem or not. There was no way to figure it out. How could you justify pronouncing it? Because I knew that he would go to the unit for three weeks, the family would get a bill for $5 million, and he had no chance of survival. <laughs> but uh, I'm fully prepared to argue the other way, too. Um, you know, he still, he, he still had myoclonic jerks. He was moving one of his arms. His, people, his pupils were, um, yeah, yeah. His cath was negative. His CAT scan showed severe anoxic encephalopathy, of course. But of course, you know, that was done two, three days later, because whatever it was going to show, it was going to show, we weren't going to change anything. So um, it's getting hard, and I think some of this is we're doing better and better CPR. Um, and by the way, I couldn't break the V-fib, so what I did was, um, after lots of double sequence defibrillations, then I gave, you ready for this? I gave IV metoprolol. Is it up there? Uh, where are beta blockers? Beta blockers and refractory VFib. This study was done in Virginia by Joe Ornato, a famous guy, he's a cardiologist, internist, and ER physician. And he took people in cardiac arrest and gave them IV beta blockers. And he, he did this amazing thing. He found better outcomes in people to convert them out of VF who got beta blockers in cardiac arrests. Isn't that kind of weird? So, you know, epinephrine's been studied for like decades now. And let me summarize the literature. You will get more pulses back, but almost nobody, uh, there's almost no subgroup which will walk out of the hospital alive than people with a greater chance that people who got placebo. But you will get more pulses back. But people will keep studying it. So why did beta blockers work? So it's fascinating, it's fascinating. Think about this, what tacky dysrhythmia do you give epinephrine to besides pulses VTAC or VFib? You don't give epinephrine to AFib, you don't give it to SVT, you don't give it to rapid A-flutter, but yet you give it to VTAC Pulses VTAC or VF. Now, why don't we give epinephrine to trauma patients? Well, you know, the theory is, it's been looked at, by the way, and the theory for years has been, well, their catecholamines are already so high, most trauma patients are, are, have great catecholamine reserve because most trauma patients are younger and they were healthy before their bad car accident or gunshot wound or stab wound, right? And their catecholamine level is so high that even when they're hypotensive, we give them fluids and, you know, really what we give them blood and all that kind of stuff and FFP and platelets. So your catecholamine levels are so high, why give epinephrine to make your catecholamine levels even higher? Won't that prevent you from cardio or defibrillating out of VFib? This is Joe Ornato's argument. So why not instead give a beta blocker during the cardiac arrest reduce the catecholamine levels, 
and now it'll be easier to convert people out of V-fib. Craziness, you say to me. Not only did he do it, he showed better outcomes. Not only did he show better outcomes, he published it in this great journal called Resuscitation. Great, great journal. He published it for critical care medicine, ER physicians, ICU docs, everybody. What? Oh, good pressure. He had better outcomes. He, he was getting good blood pressures. So he was also getting good blood pressures, by the way. One, because he didn't use metoprolol, he used esmolol. So he used a, a beta blocker, which we don't typically have in the pre hospital setting, which um, um, you, know, you give by IV drip, slow infusion. Because your concern is a valid one that if you gave an IV beta blocker, when you, when you get ROS, they'll probably be significantly hypotensive, which is what the literature shows. So it's a freaking amazing study. We did this at Journal Club. So, so it worked. It worked in this guy. It worked in this guy. So it's very interesting. So do we do this for pre-hospital patients? Do we do this in the hospital? Um, I don't know. But we've done it a couple of times by, by, um, by the docs on the console telling the paramedics to do it for people who are in refractory VF. The problem is by the time you give a beta blocker, the patient's already probably had several doses of epinephrine, so you're already behind the eight ball. You know, I think about this. There are people who are in V-fib and, and you defibrillate them and they go back into sinus rhythm right away. Then there are people in V-fib and you defibrillate them and they stay in V-fib. Somebody tell me how I figure out who's gonna be converted right away and who's not. Because I can't figure it out. But yet we treat all these people the same, but maybe they're all different. Maybe their V-fib pathway should really be 10 little pathways in ACLS, not just one big one. Time, time, time. So maybe it's time, but maybe some people have these catecholamine reserves who are younger and healthier, and they don't need more catecholamines. They don't need more epinephrine. And we're actually working against ourselves by giving them more epinephrine. Maybe those people we should be giving beta blockade to, and maybe they'll be easier to convert out of VF. This is the kind of thing where you just go for a second, hmm, that's all I want you to do. I just want you to take one second and just go, this is kind of interesting. Because although the group of patients weren't really big, he did a lot more in one study, in my opinion, on beta blockers than we've done in decades with epinephrine. He showed a difference of a drug in cardiac arrest, even though in humans, even though it was small groups, the concept that he could do this is pretty impressive. The concept that he could do this with a drug that we drip in in cardiac arrest not bolus is pretty impressive. <laughs> so this is just kind of interesting. And um, nobody ever followed this up with another study. But um, I don't know. It's something I, I, I think about. Sometimes I've, something I've ordered a couple of times from the paramedic units. Uh, I, I'm not sure where it will go. But it's made me wonder if epinephrine is like the wrong choice. But yet, when somebody's hypotensive and septic, or before I intubate them, I'm giving push dose pressures to everybody, right? We're about to publish our paper. We're doing this with our paramedic units now. It's become our standard. If their systolic's less than 90, we're pushing epinephrine, period. Be especially before we intubate them. If somebody's systolic's less than 90 before I intubate them, I'm pushing epinephrine. Craziness, you say. Craziness. Anesthesia's been doing stuff like this for decades. We've just been ignoring them. Right? And we haven't been sharing the data very well. There's a bunch of data in the OB anesthesia literature because we pulled it all. Right, so, so, so it. No, no. Right, because isoprel has been given for years, right, as, as almost a pure beta uh, for decades and, and decades. It's kind of interesting. And a lot of people in cardiothoracic used it for, for years and years. And it used to be an ACLS, right? And it isn't. The problem is when we go to study these drugs, we study them in the worst possible scenarios, in cardiac arrest. And if we ask any poison to help us in cardiac arrest or a sick patient, we're probably asking too much of it. But I know that giving a, making the blood pressure higher in a crisis situation such as respiratory failure pre-cardiac arrest is a good thing. And we just we have our data now, and we've shown people have less chance of going into cardiac arrest by giving a push dose presser in the, in the um, pre-hospital setting. What dose? Anybody? What dose? Anybody read our paper? So 
We're basically, uh, I mean, to make a long story short, we're basically having 0.1 milligram, 1 to 10,000, which I had to stop saying, right, because, you know, it's not 1 to 10,000 anymore. You guys know this? It was officially changed. It's not 1 to 1,000, 1 to 10,000 anymore. It's not going to be printed that way in the bottle anymore. There was some big thing. So the company's no longer going to be printing at 1 to 1,000. Was it offensive to somebody? Yeah, it bothered somebody. Well, I think nothing really else in medicine is 1 to 1,000, 1 to 10,000, right? So they're going to stop printing it that way. So we're basically giving 0.1 milligram um, push. We're mixing it with saline. Um, so we're basically taking 1 milligram and mixing it with like 10 mLs or 9 mLs. And we're pushing it. Yeah. And, um, but does this make sense, right? I mean, anesthesia's been doing this for a, a long time. Why don't we do it well in the emergency setting? So for the half of New Jersey that I run, this is what we're doing. We're ordering this all the time. Push those pressure protocol. We can share it with anybody. And um, it just kind of makes sense to me that if your blood pressure is 60, you're probably going to do better if your blood pressure is higher than 60. Right? So this is what we're doing. And we're, again, we're just going along with what other people have been doing for decades. And we're getting close uh, to publishing. Um, I think it's on the third revision now. Um, five minutes. So five minutes, let's go to the end. All right, here's our problem. So this is an article, um, with any luck, I don't know if they'll accept it, we're saying to the Journal of Medicine. Um, if I can finish it this Sunday. Um, I believe that Ocean County, New Jersey, one of the counties we provide EMS care to, has got one of the biggest heroin overdose problems in the world. We, this is part of the Jersey Shore. So look at, two, so red is 2016, blue is 2015. Look at March. March, uh, March we basically had, I think the number was 162, naloxone uses, 162 almost exclusively heroin, 162 in one month. In one month, in a small area, the population <laughs> is about 600,000. Your BLS carry it? BLS carry it, police carry it, um, CVS carries it, right? <laughs> there's, only, Robbie, Robbie, there's only one community in the world that doesn't carry it. But you can go to your local drugstore, get it, in any corner where there's an ATC facility. Well, <laughs> my life isn't so good. Hold on. Uh, this county, Robbie, this county carries it. Most places in North Jersey the, do not carry it at all. Right? ALS carries it, but police don't carry it, and BLS doesn't carry it. BLS has the option of carrying it if they want to. I think, you know, I think it's even worse when you have the option of saving people's lives and you choose not to. Right? Um, <laughs> ALS carries it because ALS has to carry it. And police in this county were forced to carry it, which was being forced to was a, it was a good decision to save people's lives. But 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 look at look at March of 2015 and compare it. Or I'm sorry, look at all of 2015, which is all the way on the right, the blue, and compare it to March. My March in this county was equivalent to the entire year. Our heroin overdoses went up 176 percent in this county, 170 percent. March 19th, March 19th, uh, we had 20 heroin overdoses, 20. This is in a small area, right? I'm not talking about a big area. I'm talking about a small area. In that one weekend of this population of 500,000, right? Not a lot of, not, not a huge area, uh, we had 40. Big event? 40. No, nope. no big event. So, and then I'm going to end on, I'm going to end on this study, which looked at amiodarone and lidocaine pre hospitally and again found no benefit. And then this is what I talked to you about before, which was this was the trial. You should read this New England Journal of Medicine 2015, Graham Nichol, famous, famous guy, Henry Wang, famous guy in the study, which looked at PICRU CPR and looked at stopping compressions to ventilate versus not stopping compressions to ventilate. And people who stopped, that compression stopped to ventilate had better outcomes on multiple endpoints. Let me say that again. When compressions were stopped to ventilate, people had better outcomes on multiple endpoints. What's this drama? 
Um, it, it's got a famous name. It's called the Trial of Continuous <coughs> Interrupted Chest Compressions During CPR. New England Journal of Medicine, December of 2015. What? Every five seconds the chest Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, right. So how do, how do I bring all this together? So this study got criticized because the group who got the ventilations, who did better, they didn't record in the entire study how much they were ventilating total per minute. So the argument is that group who did better, um, uh, that group who did better got a different amount of ventilations than the group who got no ventilations, where they didn't actually stop. So that was the problem, that overventilating made that category look falsely bad. That's an argument. But this is the kind of study that made everybody pause and say, we still don't have the answer. Most people who read this acknowledge this is the best study ever done, the only randomized controlled trial ever done of pit crew CPR. And everything after this was observational studies. This made us realize that there's still a big picture of cardiac arrest patients we don't know what's going on with. We still believe that pit crew CPR conceptually is the right thing to do. But this study also made me believe a couple of things. One is that there are people around the world who are teaching, just put a non-rebreather on them in cardiac arrest and do compressions and you don't have to ventilate. I think the study told us that's wrong. So there are places like Arizona and other places where they just put non-rebreathers on people and I think that's wrong. This study told me that although excessive ventilation is bad, zero ventilation is not the answer, is not the answer. And that maybe when you do compressions, you do a period of compressions, but getting that air in is still important. This study told me, and this goes back to the PEEP valve, that the, the, the PEEP valve is important, but so is the left ventricle. We can't forget about the left ventricle and the alveoli during cardiac arrest. And we have to focus on both. And maybe the reason they didn't do well was we said, let's forget about the alveoli, let's let it collapse. And that's why they had worse outcome. So, but this study shook us and said, don't think you guys are smart as you think you are, because there's a whole big piece that you're missing. Right? But all this, the only practice change I had from this was telling, I've told people publicly that if you're in a region which is not bagging at all in cardiac arrest, I believe you're doing the wrong thing now, and this proves it to me. Okay, I'm gonna end there. Any questions? Uh, your, what's your go-to drug for pain, like for renal colic or isolated fracture? Can I so uh, the reason I like ketamine is because I can give intranasal, or I can give fentanyl, uh, I can give intranasal fentanyl too. I think, e uh, I, I think either one is fine. You know, we're all trying to get away from opioids more and more and more nowadays, and ketamine is so good for so many reasons. I think because you can get both intranasally, it's totally fine. And fentanyl is good because it works quicker than morphine. And uh, if you have a fractured femur, I want to get you out of pain as quickly as possible. What about on, on uh, renal colic? Does it actually help? Or yeah, so, uh, so there's small studies on ketamine with renal colic, but not huge studies. People have published uh, papers in the hospital about giving Toradol for, for renal colic. Um, you know, I know, I know. We're, we're, we're all getting away from it. Um, I mean, fentanyl, fentanyl has got the clear, I, I think both are okay. I wouldn't say that one's better than the other, the ketamine versus the, um, versus the fentanyl. No, I would only do that for violent patients when I'm giving it intramuscularly. But when I'm doing it for pain, I would do it one per kilo. I would start at one per kilo and then titrate up from there because with the renal colic, I, I, I know it should work quickly. But I think the fentanyl is great too because the fentanyl will, will work super, super quickly. And the ketamine will just, the ketamine will, that's true, but the ketamine will dissociate um, too. And you know, renal colic patients, I don't know that I need them all to dissociate. You know, I need them, number one, to control their pain. Right, that's, the, that's their main issue. But uh, you're right, fentanyl won't last as long, so that's why in the hospital sometimes we pick other drugs like Dilaudid because we want something that's gonna last a little bit longer between the pain coming back. Questions? And my last slide, which, um, my last slide which we missed is JET 911, there's, there's the number. Uh, call us, call us 24 hours a day, we'll fly any patient anywhere in the world 24 hours a day. Um, jet 9111 and um, non-critical patients you don't turn the siren on. Oh, look at the top. <laughs> yeah.
<laughs> no, yeah, we, 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 we turn the siren on in the fixed wing air ambulance, but nobody can hear us. But the other planes get out of our way. Thank you.